Welcome to Broad Eye, the podcast that explores knowledge gaps in ophthalmology and eye care. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Broad Eye Podcast. My name is Sean Maloney, and today I will be interviewing uh, a guest I've spoken to in the past many times before. His name is Dr. Ian McDonald. He is Professor Emeritus of the Department of Ophthalmology at the University of Alberta. Dr. McDonald, welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you very much for asking me to speak with you, Sean. Uh, it's, it's always a pleasure. And we've, we've uh, spoken a few times in the past before, and I think we actually first met back in 2008 or 2009 when you were at the uh, NEI and I went for genetic testing. So it's, uh, it's, been, a, it's been a few years. <laughs> yes, it has. And that was a, it was a very nice meeting then. And it's nice yeah. meeting now. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so maybe I can use that as a bit of a segue into, you know, the first topic I was hoping to dive into was just the field of oxygenetics in general. And I'm just wondering from your perspective, you know, have there been any major or significant advances in, or discoveries? So advances maybe in the clinical side or even discoveries in the basic science side um, in, in the realm of oxygenetics in recent years? Well, I think the last 10 years have been um, absolutely transformative, let's say, to the, to the area. We've had the advent of gene therapy in the eye uh, when other therapies, let's say, have not proven to be particularly um, helpful or, or positive, let's say, in terms of response for uh, heritable ocular disorders. And we've had real breakthroughs, I think, on the technology side in terms of not so much um, rehabilitation for vision loss, but the area of genetic testing, where in the past we depended upon research laboratories. Now we have access to commercial laboratories who are undertaking the testing and providing a great service to patients and clinicians. So that's a, it's an interesting topic. I want to actually circle back to that um, again about some of the, the commercial testing available. Um, but so where do you see, or can you predict some of the um, advancements or changes that maybe they're coming in the pipeline in the next five to 10 years as well in this space? Oh, absolutely. Well, one thing that our community knows very well is the story about Luxterna and the research that was done on one of the forms of Lever congenital amaurosis due to mutations in the RPE65 gene. We knew that there was a, a dog model of this disorder and the dog underwent gene therapy and could navigate with the treated eye quite aptly in a maze couldn't do that with the untreated eye only. Those initial experiments and all the preclinical experiments before animals really led to a human clinical trial of gene therapy. And using a disabled virus containing the normal copy of the gene, patients, volunteers underwent uh, a first safety trial of the gene therapy. And then that was expanded when it was shown to be safe uh, to include more patients. And now we have the advent of a product that is generally accepted as a standard treatment for lever congenital amaurosis due to mutations in the RPE65 gene. And that was a huge win for eye genetics uh, internationally. And some of the major principles of that won a big award, the Champilot Award uh, for all of the work that they had done most, most recently in the past, just two or three years ago, I think. I've lost track because of COVID, of course. <laughs> and um, that really has opened up the whole area of gene therapies for, for eye research. And not only viral vectors introducing a replacement gene, but also using other technologies that are based on enabling a proper protein product to be formed by introducing an antisense oligonucleotide to block the production of an abnormal protein. These sort of technologies were certainly not part of our lexicon, part of our language uh, 10 years ago, but they are now. 
And so that's a maybe a, a short introduction to the topic. And it's hard for the clinician, it's hard for the patient to keep up with the immense change, the volume of change, the new trials that are being brought to, to, to bear to help uh, patient access. No, I think that's it, that's uh, you know definitely a good um, some good insight. Uh, I just maybe want to touch on something you said. So, uh, and, and see if I'm understanding this. So, some of the gene therapy approaches, let's say, to replace um, you know to be able to replace proteins that uh, uh, or to replace a gene that has a mutation that might otherwise produce a maybe a, a mutated or truncated protein. Um, so at the same time that you're trying to replace these genes, you're now also trying to block the production of the aberrant protein. So, uh, for example, um, for a sort of called Usher syndrome, which is a, the most common form of deaf blindness, uh, some of the patients have a certain form, and that form of Usher syndrome is the result of a, a protein that is not properly constructed. And if one can use what is called an antisense oligonucleotide to enable a functional protein to be formed, well, that potentially could result in the improvement of retinal function in that, in that patient. And therein lies the let's say the benefit of using a, a, an antisense oligonucleotide therapy, you can trick the cells into saying, oh, okay, this is, this is not the right product. I can use this blocking agent based on an RNA to prevent the cell from making the abnormal protein, but make a protein that's altered, but still functional, and then recover the function of this the protein in the cell and enable uh, no, the normal physiology of the, of the cell. Okay. No, that makes, that makes sense. Um, maybe we can shift gears a little bit to talk about choroideremia, because I know that, sure. you know, over the years, um, you know, you and your uh, collaborators in the lab have contributed immensely to this field. So, Maybe you could just give a little overview of what choroideremia is and maybe how the research uh, or therapeutic approaches have evolved over time. Certainly. Uh, so choroideremia is a single gene disorder. It's all caused by mutations in a gene called CHM, uh, sort of an acronym for choroideremia. It's a male-only disease in, in, in a sense, uh, because it, if it's sex-linked or X-linked, the gene is on the X chromosome. However, being a, an X-linked trait, there are female carriers who, with time, may have some problems as well, much like the affected male individual. We know that all the genetic changes in the gene result in a reduction or absence of the protein. And simply because of that, the protein isn't sufficient in the cells, especially in the eye, and doesn't enable the normal physiology and function of those cells. The cell that the eye has that is most impacted by this is the retinal pigment epithelium. This is the cell layer, the single cell layer right at the back of the eye that acts like the black box in a brownie camera to absorb the light, but it also, when the light comes into the eye, it's, it's also absorbed by the photoreceptors, and the photoreceptors undergo a constant renewal, and the renewal is through its, their interaction with the retinal pigment epithelium. So there's this interplay in between the neural retina with all this amplification of the signal from the photoreceptors and the pigmented layer. And if the pigmented layer isn't functioning well, well, unfortunately, the signal of light coming into the eye isn't as strong as it should be. And with time, uh, the retina undergoes a 
gradual loss of function with loss of visual field and loss of visual acuity. So choroideremia was seen as a likely candidate uh, for gene therapy because, gosh, if most of the mutations in the gene resulted in absence of the protein, well, my goodness, why couldn't we just replace the gene with a normal copy? And then that copy would make a normal protein product. And the success of Luxturna really drove the project to bring a gene replacement therapy for choroideremia using the same template, using a, a disabled virus called AAV to carry a normal copy of the gene into the eye underneath the retina to place that gene into the retinal pigment epithelium and have the retinal pigment epithelium function well. Did, is that did I capture that? Yeah, no, no, that, that's 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 great. Now I'm just curious, you know, where where that is now. Is this something that people are actually pursuing in the clinic now? Oh yes, most definitely. So our group and three other groups, not all synchronously, but our group in Edmonton undertook a safety trial of an AAV carrying the gene in uh, 2015, and we reported on the outcome of our trial in 2018. Earlier, we had uh, had the experience of Robert McLaren at Oxford University, who'd also done a trial in patients with choroideremia in the UK and had shown that there was safety. Unfortunately, uh, we experienced um, two patients that had this subretinal injection of the disabled virus uh, with a complication of loss of vision. Uh, actually, one individual lost vision, the other individual had inflammation within the eye itself and didn't lose vision. And we were very concerned that perhaps we hadn't really understood whether this particular approach was sufficiently safe to move on to a broader number of patients. So we elected not to pursue the trial with more patients. There were other centers in, in the world, in Europe, in the UK, in Germany, in Miami initially, and then more individuals elsewhere were involved in the clinical trial. And most recently, the company that took over the trial um, has announced that they showed that the trial, in fact, didn't meet, the, let's say, the success criteria that they had hoped for. And so this was a bit disappointing. Um, and so we remain a little bit skeptical of, as to whether a gene replacement technique with a disabled virus and choroideremia is going to be the fix that we were hoping for. So whereas the, these are clinical trials, they truly are experiments and we don't know what the outcome is going to be. And it, whereas it's a disappointment that we didn't achieve success, boy, we've learned a lot about this. We've learned that introducing a viral vector underneath the retina is not without risk, might cause inflammation and might unfortunately result in loss of vision when we hadn't anticipated that. And so it's, we are far better informed now than we were, let's say, five or more years ago about the potential risks of, of that approach. There has been another... Uh, oh, it, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I think it's important to highlight, I mean, because... You know, we look at, let's say, Luxterna and say, hey, this is this is great. So it's simply, you know, uh, copy paste with, you know, with a different, uh, voting for a different gene. And lo and behold, we're going to, you know, fix all genetic eye diseases. And it doesn't seem like it's going to be necessarily quite that simple. Yes, it was fantastic that we had the, for the field that is, and for the patients and, and the clinicians that we had success in the 
first example of um, Lexterna because it enabled us to move into all the other diagnoses and say, okay, what do you think will work for this? Oh my, my goodness, it should. Well, for choroideremia, it's been to date, unfortunately disappointing, but it, that doesn't mean it's not going to work for other diagnoses. We just don't have the information in front of us as yet. And we don't know that we have the proper carrier, the, the proper vector. Maybe there are vectors that we should be exploring uh, that are perhaps safer. Uh, perhaps we'll get into the cell more aptly and produce a protein product. And maybe we're, we're not doing this in the appropriate manner. Maybe we should be using um, not an injection underneath the retina, but an injection directly into the eye, which might be safer. Um, the only problem is with when you use an injection directly into the, what we call a vitreous, which is the um, aqueous jelly that's in behind the lens uh, and in front of the retina, you have to use more of the vector. And when you use more of the vector, then you're obviously using more um, product and it may uh, unfortunately experience an inflammation simply by the amount of material that's being put in the eye and the eye is sensing it as foreign and saying, mm, well, we don't need that around. So we're just gonna have to shut that down. So there's so much that we're learning, Sean. Um, it's hard for the patient to recognize our enthusiasm in terms of, of learning uh, isn't necessarily translating yet into treatment, but still, I think that's what medicine has always been about, uh, where we, we try things, uh, they don't work with time, we get in often on something better, and all of a sudden we've got something that's acclaimed as a treatment. So. We, we couldn't have done it, I think, without the success of Luxturn in the first instance. Well, I think that, you know, sometimes these roadblocks, you know, they're, they're a blessing in disguise because, uh, especially for, you know, some rare diseases where we might think, hey, we're just going to continue on this path for, you know, take us six or eight or 10 years, but we're going to get there and this is going to, you know, uh, work because it worked in this, whatever, it worked in another disease. So I was hoping to switch gears a little bit. Um, you alluded to COVID before and uh, was wondering if you can maybe comment on how COVID has impacted the, uh, well, both the research environment for basic research, as well as, you know, clinical trials. And, and if any of those studies have been impacted by, uh, by COVID in general. Oh, certainly. So part of the problem with research is it depends very much on the supply of many materials. And um, so in the lab, we've, be, we've had great difficulty getting uh, tissue culture supplies. And some of these experiments that we're doing for gene therapy depend on uh, cell culture. And without the supply, well, everything's pushed back. Um, unfortunately, we lost uh, um, a series of cells uh, simply because of um, a problem with equipment. Uh, it put us back about three months. Many of these cells are what we call induced pluripotential stem cells that are housed in incubators that are uh, hermetically sealed, let's say, to prevent infection, but sometimes things happen. So that's one problem uh, on the research side. On the other side, unfortunately, in terms of the clinical trials, patients have not been able to travel. Uh, they've not been able to either come into the country or go to the United States uh, without difficulty. And it has pushed back uh, clinical trials. I'm also aware that for the companies that are involved in these clinical trials, there is a, a queuing up for the companies that are manufacturing the gene therapy products. And that has pushed things back. And so I'd say COVID has had a major impact on, let's say, clinical trials and all of the 
preclinical experiments that are ongoing for gene therapy. And also, I think that's it's some important thing for people to understand too. I mean, we we look and we see how quickly things have moved forward on you know developing vaccines for COVID, and this is fantastic. Uh, but there's been a lot of other you know research domains that have suffered dramatically. I think in the last you know call it 18 months or 16 months, right? So I think it's good to uh, you know to you know highlight that or at least people make people aware of that. And I don't. I think it's going to be some um, you know sorting through over the next probably another six to 12 months before things can really get back on track in, in many cases, if that, if that makes sense. So you have done uh, an enormous amount for the field of ocular genetics. Uh, no one's going to deny that. And you have actually been nominated for a lifetime achievement award, which is certainly uh, not something that a lot of people will get nominated for by the, the Canadian college of uh, medical geneticists, I believe is, is the entity. Um, I was wondering if maybe you could just comment on that. Like, you know, what does it take to, to get nominated for, for that award or receive that award? And, uh, you know, how do you feel about that? Well, I was bowled over. Um, I hadn't expected it. I wasn't aware of it. I uh, was informed. And uh, as fate would have it, I was supposed to receive it in Newfoundland uh, two, two summers ago at their national meeting. So it didn't occur then, it didn't occur uh, this summer. Everything was all virtual. <laughs> and um, it probably takes your friends and probably your students uh, who to nominate you for this. And so the nomination was in, in recognition of mentoring, uh, mentoring individuals within the community of genetics uh, in Canada. And uh, for that, I was very grateful to have received that notice. You don't really recognize the impact you're having on, let's say, patients or families and, um, and the students that you're teaching along the way until something like this comes along. When you realize, gee whiz, uh, those individuals started out many years ago and look at them now. And so the, the great joy that a teacher has is seeing the success of their students. And uh, so I was very pleased to receive that accolade. Um, I, th I thought as well of the mentors that I had had in the past and, and shared with one of them my um, joy in knowing that I had been uh, nominated for this award um, just because I thought he would want to know that. <laughs> um, well, I think it's, it's probably something that, you know, um, you know, I, I'm thinking it must feel pretty good when you, you know, as a mentor yourself, uh, when, when you have mentors, if you've looked up to a role models in your career mm -hmm. and uh, to, to have this, you know, concrete, evidence i guess or proof that there are people along the way that uh you have trained or or uh, worked with who now see you in the same light that you see your role models and mentors right so i think it must be a must be a, quite the feeling well it was and i recognize that uh, i couldn't have got here uh, to where i am without support along the way from uh, let's say research grants, but also from fellowships. Um, initially, I was given a fellowship from the, the IODE, the provincial chapter of the IODE, uh, for their Concern for Children project. And uh, this was to enable people to train as geneticists uh, to uh, enable access for um, families uh, to genetic counseling. And so I, I took up uh, the opportunity to, to train with a man by the name of Alistair Hunter, who was really, really important in my training. He opened the door to medical genetics for me. Interestingly, I had phoned up my, one of my professors um, at McGill, Clark Fraser, an eminent uh, clinical geneticist in Canada, one who was given this Founders Award many years ago. And I asked him, who would you go and train with if you received an award? And he said, without second thought, I would go with Alistair Hunter. And so Alistair 
uh, really started me off in this pathway. Um, I always knew, having been involved in undergraduate research and postgraduate research, really in genetics, that I wanted to be involved in medical genetics. But gosh, somebody has to open the door for you. And uh, <laughs> for sure, for sure. <laughs> so um, th this was remarkable. And um, I never would have thought that I would have had a career that it'd take me where I, where I went to become an ophthalmologist, to, to lead a, a clinical research team, uh, to do gene therapy in the eye. I, I wouldn't have thought that that was where it would lead, but it did. And it has been um, truly a wonderful experience for myself, my family, and the people who have, have worked with me. Can you maybe just comment on on some of those early days, like, you know, uh, we all know you now uh, for, for uh, you know, the successes that you've had in the field. Um, but what were some of the early days like in whether well, going back to medical school and what was maybe the, the driving force behind, you know, the, the interest in ophthalmology, the interest in genetics in, in general? Okay. Well, so while I was in Ottawa, uh, trained to be a medical geneticist, a lady called me up from the Ottawa Citizen. Her name was Barbara Owens. And she said to me, is anybody doing any work on a disease called choroideremia? It runs in my family. And I said, um, hmm, uh, well, I don't think so. But would you like to get started? And so I went about understanding what choroideremia was all about. And then I... I started to use some of the tools that, that were then available to look at mapping the gene because nobody knew what the gene was. We knew there was a gene on the X chromosome because men had the disorder, their, their mothers showed signs but didn't have the same degree of affectation. Um, and so we used molecular genetic probes. We used these pieces of DNA that people had been able to clone on the X chromosome through somatic cell hybrids or, uh, or other ways and tried to use, let's say, very primitive techniques of chopping up the DNA, running them on a gel, trying to link the actual piece of DNA that you had in the clone with what's in the cell and then see that they that these fragments of DNA would segregate in a certain fashion would s sort on the on the gel and you could follow to say ah yeah I think this piece of DNA is pretty close to the gene well that, was, that took a long time that took uh, months to do because you'd have to collect the 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 uh, DNA from patients, uh, and then if you had enough patients, then you could do the experiment. And this took me through the wilds of uh, the Upper Ottawa Valley uh, to little places like Eganville and Barry's Bay. Um, and um, it followed the initial uh, dispersion of a group of individuals who came from Ireland. There were six women who were all carriers who emigrated to Canada, not because of the potato famine, but uh, their father was interested in having them meet um, young men who were Protestant uh, because he didn't want to have his um, daughters marry Catholics. So it's an interesting dialogue, isn't it? So um, these all these women were all carriers of choroideremia, and they all had big families, uh, 12, 14 children, and some of them had choroideremia. And so I was then introduced to this very large family from which we could derive uh, genetic material to undertake mapping of the gene. And in the course of doing all this research, I recognized, gee whiz, even though I was a physician and even though I was a geneticist, I knew so little about the eye. And I said, I had to become an ophthalmologist. And so I trained in Ottawa to be an ophthalmologist. 
and uh, that really pushed me into the field of iGenetics, recognizing that there's so much information to be gained by doing research in that area. And that's a short story of how I got started in iGenetics. That is not a story I was expecting. <laughs> so <laughs> it's it's uh, definitely definitely interesting. And I know we've we've talked in the past, and uh, I've heard um, a number of stories, but that one never came up. So uh, I'm, I'm glad I'm glad you shared that. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe just one more question before we wrap things up. But uh, you know, for patients who are listening to this podcast, and even for you know some some physicians, whether they're general practitioners or eye care professionals, um, do you have any advice? for patients who know that they have a genetic eye condition, whether that, you know, be around genetic testing or, you know, following clinical trials or not following the news or, or any, any advice that you might share with them? Oh, well, most certainly. Well, I would say, first off, maintain an element of hope. There's still a lot to be learned. And maybe we haven't got the the right diagnosis or the right treatment at the present time, but that doesn't mean that with time that there won't be something available. Uh, even for the case of choroideremia, where let's say the viral gene therapy is not going to work very well. Mm, well, in fact, there are probably other therapies that are going to be impactful in the future. And I have some sense that these antisense oligonucleotide therapies will be one of the approaches. In terms of genetic testing, I spoke a little bit about the genetics of the disorder that I studied all my career and how hard it was. But now we have genetic analyses called next generation sequencing, very catchy name. And it allows us to do what we couldn't do before, is to look at all of the coding sequences of the genes, of the very many genes that may be involved in, for example, retinal eye disease or optic nerve disease. And there are commercial panels that people can have access to that are now paid for in general by the health maintenance organization or the provincial funder or state funder that will enable access. Let's say a patient had been seen and examined and had some testing done maybe five to 10 years ago and they didn't come up with something. Well, now it's very likely that the patient would be properly diagnosed with a panel test uh, of commercially available testing that's available. Uh, and the importance of having genetic testing is it puts you in the queue for gene therapies or other therapies that may be appropriate for the disorder. And so I would say the advice would be to contact a medical geneticist or an ophthalmologist and say, um, I understand there's genetic testing available for my disorder. Is that something that I could pursue? How do I access that? Um, and that would be the start. And it would be, I think, very, a very positive start because the patient, the family would have an appropriate diagnosis that would enable them to understand the prognosis, what the management might be, um, and the like. I shouldn't go on and on, Sean, but um, I am very passionate about this because I, it, the more information you have, the better you're better off you are. You can begin to understand, well, what might be uh, the appropriate for me to consider for the future? Oh, well, no, for sure. And, and I think that, uh, you know, I think you, you know, offer some sage advice there. And I think the first thing that a patient who is newly diagnosed with a, uh, well, any condition, but in this case, a, you know, a genetic uh, eye disease, first thing they want to do is, okay, what can I do? What's in, what's in my control, right? What, what steps can I take to, to do something here? Because there's a certain sense of helplessness. And I think that, uh, you know, pointing out that, Hey, what well, you should go after gene therapy, or not gene therapy, I'm sorry, genetic testing as a, you know, a good first step, uh, in the path. It's not, I don't think it's something that a lot of people do. And I know that, you know, from speaking with, um, well, many people that, 
some of the frontline eye care providers, um, there's even some confusion among them about where to even direct patients. So hopefully as you know, time goes on and these uh, commercial tests are you know, become more widely used, even though they're available, become more widely used, hopefully that information uh, flows to the primary care physicians as well to, um, to be able to direct patients to this, these resources. That, that's correct, Sean. As well, uh, there are patient advocacy groups as in Fighting Blindness Canada, Fighting, Foundation Fighting Blindness in the United States, who tries to link patients to registries that will enable them to be linked to future clinical trials. Um, and one of the provisos is that in order to be in the registry, it'd be important that you have uh, genetic testing done so that we can link you as these diagnoses really are very specific and the treatments are very specific to the diagnoses. So why not get this done? And then you'll know for sure why it is you have this problem. Yeah, no, I think that's a great angle too, is that having some foundations like that, creating those registries, because as a patient myself, it, I think it'd be great to say, okay, here's, you know, my, my, I've, I've been diagnosed with a condition. Uh, we know what the mutation is, you know, my gender, my age, maybe some of the, you know, recent uh, visual acuity exams or whatever it may be and have, um, you know, co companies that are running clinical trials or, or universities running clinical trials be able to reach out to me and say, hey, you might qualify as long as you still meet some of these same criteria. How would you like to participate, participate rather than the other way around? Because there's a lot of patients who try to sift through clinical trials on sites like clinicaltrials.gov and they have no idea what they're looking at because they just haven't had, you almost need, you need formal training to, you know, in that space to even understand it. So I think that like what you said, the Foundation of Fighting Blindness and other organizations are doing is, is certainly a, a step in the right direction there. Yes, and but, you won't get lost in that regard. <laughs> no, exactly, exactly. Listen, Dr. McDonald, this has been fun. Uh, it's, I always enjoy speaking with you. Um, I feel like this is something that uh, I'd like to have you back again for a round two at some point because I, I feel like there's a lot of uh, a lot of material that we could we could cover and it's certainly beneficial to to the audience. Um, but yeah, I just want to take the opportunity for, for thanking you for joining today and uh, sharing your stories and your wisdom. Well, thank you very much, Sean. It's a great pleasure to connect with you again and I would wish uh, your listeners well uh, as well. Thank you. And that concludes today's episode of the Broad Eye Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. Of course, ratings and reviews are always welcome. And you can certainly share this episode with any of your colleagues or friends who might enjoy it. Thanks for listening.